Good afternoon. We, we get the pleasure slash speed to close this so you can go out and have a cocktail afterwards. So I appreciate being here. It's an honor to be able to host um, my people, my farmers, the farm community. My name is Jim Goss. I'm a farm manager at the Atkins Group. Um, I've been a farm manager for about 35 years. I started out as a little kid with sows, cows, and plows, and I transitioned into agronomy, spreadsheets, and communication for landowners. So it's a pleasure for me to be able to up here to host the producers panel. I'm going to let each of them take a minute or two and introduce themselves. My name is uh, Eric Rund. I farm uh, 20 minutes south of here, actually. Corn, soybeans, and miscanthus. Uh, I came to the University of Illinois as a student and um, spent years in Peace Corps after that, and I'm back home now. We're farming again, and uh, about 16 years ago, we started growing biomass. Shortly after uh, the energy farm was uh, opened here at the university. Uh, held a lot of interest for me because you could graze more ethanol per acre than you could with corn, theoretically. And so uh, I figured if we're going to have be uh, producing ethanol, well, I'd do it the most economical way. Besides that, it had a lot more benefits as far as uh, soil erosion, nutrient, um, uh, keeping the nutrients on the, on the ground. And from there, long story, we'll pass it on. My name is Sarah Hastings. I um, co-own a grain handling business, so I build the big silver circles out that you see that hold corn, soybeans, any other crop you can put in them. And I also farm, and our farm kind of starts right where Urbana stops. My neighbor up the road has an Urbana address. So um, we grow traditional corn and soybeans, and... Um, hopefully raising our next generation on the farm. Uh, my name is Eric Miller, a uh, farm in Pyatt County. So that is about 35 miles southwest of here. Uh, we grow corn, soybean, wheat, and uh, we also do cover crops. Uh, it's mostly a no-till and strip-till operation. And starting in 2014, uh, we started hosting University of Illinois researchers on the farm, and that continues today. Uh, and I did, uh, I was invited to speak here today because I was the winner of the Glenn Brandt uh, Prize last year. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I was glad that the folks that won this year know what they're gonna do with the $10,000 because I did not. And uh, I got a big check like they did last year. And I, I enjoyed the big check, so I carried it around with me for you know a couple weeks or a couple months or whatever. So people would ask, what are you gonna do with $10,000? I did not know what I was gonna do with $10,000. So I think I got about uh, $270,000 worth of suggestions what to do with $10,000. Okay, well, we've had, we've had the perspective all day from the digital folks, from the carbon space, from everybody, but I wanted to get it from the producer now. So the first topic that we're gonna to touch on, and we'll, we'll have all three of you answer this one. Um, Eric Miller, let's start with you. Are you in the paid carbon space, and why or why not? Uh, so we are not in the paid carbon space. Uh, part of that is just because of the research we do, so we have to sometimes vary things from year to year. Uh, we did look into the programs, uh, really when they started being rolled out uh, three, four, five years ago. The payment per acre, and, and I heard one of the previous panelists uh, uh, comment on that, was a very low dollar figure. So you've got additional risk, additional changes, you know, to your farming operation for very little uh, economic return. Uh, so, so that's, you know, kind of the main reason we're not in it. And then, of course, like whenever you get a new program out, many entities were trying to enter that carbon space to fulfill different needs. And uh, 
in some of the programs we looked at, we felt that there were almost, I'm not going to say unethical, but I'll say unethical because that's the only word I can think of right now. It, it, it just didn't seem like they were programs that were going to function properly long term. Um, we too looked into carbon markets because who doesn't like a little extra money in the bank for something that you may already be doing. Um, we're very low till on our farm, so we thought, well, this might work. Um, and then we got a little concerned. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market, and farmers like to know, since we can't control the weather, we like to know what we can control. And it was very concerning to me what happens if I lock up a certain amount of acres into a carbon program and we have a legislative change or a political change and it's all of a sudden I'm being told, well, you have to have a certain amount of credit for every tillage pass or every pass I want to make in the field. And I didn't want to have to go buy a carbon credit from my neighbor to do a practice that I've been doing on my farm for 15 years or 20 years that I think is good for the environment and good for the soil. So we decided to just kind of sit back and just continue doing our best job to be good stewards of the ground we have. Now, I'm coming to the same situation. Um, we have been no-tilling and strip-tilling for 30 years, and what we would get out of all the carbon programs that were paying anything would be nothing, because we've already instigated those programs. Uh, we could gain a little, I suppose, but with cover costs, but very little, and it was hardly worth it. it uh, these programs at least that are presented now, um, just aren't feasible. Yeah, it's, I see a lot of that out there where we've been doing the right things for a lot of years, and until the last year or so, that didn't matter. Now, now we're starting to decide maybe that's going to matter, and you, you've been doing it right, we're going to reward you. But again, we can talk about carbon and how, how we're not being compensated for it for a long time. Hey, Jim, uh, I'm going to make one other comment, and someone pointed this out to me, and that it really kind of hit home as well as far as carbon. They said, uh, uh, geez, Eric, are you carbon neutral on your farm? And we are not. We are not even close. And he said, so you're going to sell carbon credits when you are not carbon neutral. And that, that kind of hit home with me as well. Why should I be able to do that? Well, as producers, we, we tend to sit back and evaluate, and that's what you don't really know how to evaluate because you start paying me for it, and then all of a sudden we start to develop it and say, oh, wait, you, you can't sell any carbon credits because you're not zero. You're not carbon zero yet. So um, let's move on. You know, we're, we've, uh, we're here at a digital or a ag tech conference, and we talked a lot this morning about digital agriculture. We've talked about yield monitors. We've talked about everything. But how has ag tech specifically influenced your farms? I mean, I'm, I'm old enough here that we had one of the first yield monitors in 1994 on our home farm. But we didn't have GPS. We didn't have, we were collecting data that we had no idea what to do with. Now you fast forward 30 years, we, we have a whole bunch of data. And I think they talked about that with AI. We've got a bunch of data we don't really know what to do with. But I'd be curious as producers, how you're, if you're using much ag tech, if you are, how do you see it influencing decisions that you make for the future? Sarah, we'll start with you. Um, it's, it's always nice to have a way to measure quantitatively what you do on your farm. So, you know, we use it if um, we'll maybe split a field into two different tillage practices. And it's really nice to look at the end of the year and see, um, did that have an impact on yield? Or do we have a spot that year after year is either high yielding or low yielding? Do we need to build fertility? We, you know, we soil test on a on a grid to make sure that we're spreading the right nutrients. But, you know, does this farm need a little bit of extra tile in there to control a wet spot that's in a field? And it's, it's nice to compare, you know, how did this hybrid perform? Um, planting date is really impactful on our farm. How early we get out there really affects our yield. And it's just nice to be able to quantify what you see out there at the end of the year. It's one thing to look at it when it's out and growing, but it's another to see the real numbers when you look at it. Sarah's also, does it, has it affected your grain bin? 
Um, we have a lot of farmers putting controllers on their grain bins that monitor continuously the right amount of air. So we, you want to put just the right amount of air on your crop. If you have a grain that needs drying down for longevity of storage, you need to bring bringing in drier air usually to dry it off or keep it at the right moisture. And it's really nice, you know, we, before, before some of these um, monitoring cables and moisture sensors, it, you didn't have a way, you'd have to dig in there. So, you know, we always tell farmers, put your, open up the door, go look at it. Um, if I build a bin for a customer that's new to grain storage, I say, you know, if your grain bin was full of dollars, do you think you'd go check it? And that's basically what's in there. That's your grain you're hopefully going to convert to dollars someday. So um, it's um, a good sense of security, peace of mind to know that there's a computer system out there monitoring what's in there, and it's always looking for the right amount of data. Like if you're... Um, fan needs to run, that fan might kick on at 2 a.m. and it'll turn on your fan, run it for the right amount of time, and then it shuts it off. So, and you can see that, you can track it on your phone or a computer and see what's going on, when did it run last, and it's peace of mind knowing everything's um, running to the parameters that you set for it. Eric Miller. So I will give an example uh, of, a, of a piece of equipment that we use on our corn planter. This is AgTech that did not exist uh, until just recently. And uh, one of our first uh, presentations today uh, was a fellow from Precision Planting. So that is the, the company that makes this product. But before I start, about, uh, start talking about that product, I, I've got to kind of call him out a little bit. Do you guys remember what he said about farmers and Walt Disney World? <laughs> All farmers hate Walt Disney World. Couldn't believe this. Hate's a strong word. And then he said the reasons are, um, uh, thanks for laughing at this. He said, he said the reasons are the crowds. Okay, I guess I do hate large crowds. Well, most large crowds, uh, not this one. Uh, and then the cost of things. Well, farmers are kind of cheap. And this flashback, uh, I had a flashback 20 years ago when we went to Walt Disney World and it's the end of the day and you're in Walt Disney World and you're kind of, you know, held hostage by them and, you know, the three-year-old kid is hungry. So again, remember this was 20 years ago, so you, you spend $7 on a grilled cheese sandwich. Okay, maybe he was right. Maybe farmers kind of dislike Walt Disney World. Anyway, okay, back to precision planting. So we use a lot of their products. They don't make planters, but they make products that make planters better. So they came out with a product about 20 years ago. It was called a seed firmer. And it was just a simple piece of flexible plastic, and it ran in the seed trench, and the seed would drop in the trench. This little flexible piece of plastic would follow right behind it and push this, make sure the seed is pushed down firmly in the soil. And you got a good yield increase doing this. So most farmers adop, uh, you know, adapted this, adopted this technology. This was technology 20 years ago. Well, precision planting has greatly improved products. And they came out with a, instead of a seed firmer, a smart firmer. So instead of just having a simple piece of plastic running through the soil, they have put sensors and technology on this. Some of the things that you can get in real time as you're planting are things like organic matter, which is kind of a quality of your soil. You can get clean furrow. This is making sure that you're not have, you don't have residue from the previous crop in the seed trench, you know, interfering with that seed. Okay, these are really handy things. Another thing they have, uh, will, uh, they will give you soil moisture as you're planting. So here's my example of a technology that did not exist that is making my life better and that is, is making me money. So this spring we were planting, it was, it was late April, it was the last, or excuse me, late May, last fields that we were doing. And it was a very wet farm, wet soils. Uh, we get out there uh, and we're looking at the seed uh, trench, two inches deep, plenty of moisture in there. So we think, okay, this, this will plant just fine. But again, it's late May. So we've got the summer sun, we've got longer days, we've got warmer temperatures. So about the top inch of the soil was fairly dry, 
but where we were planting was in good moisture. So I was expecting to have the correct amount of moisture. So I go through the field and I'm looking at my monitor and I would get flashes of, of low soil moisture, not enough moisture, not enough moisture. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? What was happening was I didn't have enough down pressure to keep that seed trench sidewall stable. And the dry soil was falling into the bottom of the seed trench and getting onto the seed. So instead of planting that seed into moisture, it was being planted into dry soil. I couldn't, if I didn't have that technology, I knew I had moisture at the two inch depth. I, I would not have known this. So this kept happening, you know, for a round or two. So we got out and we finally started digging around. And I've got just enough experience planting where I knew I think, I think I'm getting dry soil in the, in the seed trench. So I just increased the down pressure on the planter a minimal amount and, and that solved the problem. I don't have pictures of it today, but you, we went out and looked at the field after emergence. There were field, uh, there was a lot of plants that were in moisture that germinated, but I would say 15% of the plants needed a rain on it before it germinated. So we had different growth stages. When you have plants that are at different growth stages, the late emergers don't become weeds, but, but your yield potential goes down drastically. So that is a five minute explanation of a, of a you know, true product that, is, that, that worked for us and, and will work in the future. Yeah, I was gonna, you stole my thunder, I was gonna. <laughs> We have that same equipment on the planter, um, and that is truly amazing. That will do more for increasing yields than uh, probably any of the technology that came along in the last few years. Uh, um, yield monitors, I'm the same way as you, Jim. We had them at first. The first thing, about the only thing you could do with them is it's kind of neat that you're getting more yield here than there, but no one had come up with the algorithms yet so what do you do with this piece where the uh, yield was a little higher? Well, what do you do there? Do you add more fer fertilizer there to get a little more yield? Or do you cut back on the fertilizer there? Do you, uh, now we've got planters that can adjust this, the number of seeds as you go through the field according to the soil type. Uh, we need universities to do a little study in here to tell us, come up with the algorithms to plug into the planter to tell us when, when is the best time to increase the population, when is the best time to cut back. Um, and all this has come about because of the technology that's come down the road. It has caused us to, uh, well, well, and a good example of what it's allowed us to do is uh, put soil um, yield tests, plot tests, if you would, on a 40-acre patch rather than a patch the size of this room because the yield monitors and, and the technology on the planter, we can separate out what we do in each plot and come back and harvest, come back and harvest, and harvest with the combine and record what the yields were in each one of those plots. Um, technology has come along and given us more questions than, and answers sometimes. Um, no, I would agree with that. I, I look at thousands of acres of yield data every fall, and many times I have way more questions than I have answers. Mm -hmm. Now that's intriguing because that means that even though we're, we're hitting high, high yields now, there's more there available. So we know when we unzip that bag of seed corn that's got 600 bushel yield potential and we're getting 250, we've got room for improvement now we know ways to do it. Mm -hmm. So, Eric, I want to touch on, I mean, because you grow the miscanthus, I want to touch on that. We're, we know that the green energy wave is, is happening here in Illinois. And we see a little buzz about, little buzz about bioenergy crops, miscanthus especially, today. 
where do where do we see the the future for Illinois producers to grow miscanthus? That's the first question. The second question is there's a lot of government money being thrown into solar and wind. Do you see the need for an incentive based system to, to grow the miscanthus space? Yeah. Um well, first of all, I think those of us who are growing biomass um, think that what we can produce in energy with biomass ought to be treated the same as we treat solar energy and wind power uh, by the state, giving us the same tax breaks or incentives to uh, produce energy that way. Um, if I burn uh, the University of Illinois at the energy farm has a boiler now that burns miscanthus or any kind of biomass and it can produce heat for half the cost uh, in the fuel as you can with LP gas. That's a pretty big incentive. Why aren't more people using it? One of the main reasons is that the equipment is more expensive to get started. Um, we spent uh, three different trips to Germany and, and Europe looking at biomass boilers because they've been using biomass a lot longer than we have for to heat their homes, the schools, the factories. And um, uh, they have a technology in boilers that we, we simply didn't have here. We looked for one when we put one in at the energy farm. Um, the, uh, the equipment's a little more expensive to get started with, but once you're there, fuel is half the cost, you're saving half that energy. And uh, even though you're burning something, what you're burning and releasing in carbon, that plant collected that same carbon when it was growing. So really, you're almost carbon neutral. Um, and I think that ought to be rewarded by the, by the, by the public, uh, by the government. Uh, the way it rewards uh, solar and wind power. Um, as far as how it looks to the farmers, if, when, if uh, we sell our miscanthus as uh, turkey bedding, um, w which is the best market. They paid the most for it. And uh, for years, we were making as much or more money with miscanthus than we did corner beans. It, it, and it continued that way for 10 years until recently, uh, the last three years, corn went to around $7, bean was around 16 And uh, what well, was no-brainer then, you raised corn and beans for two years. And now today, it's back down, what, corn's below $4 cash and beans are uh, below 12 So um, a steady market, for farmers who want to be in business a long time, uh, Miscanthus has a place in those markets. Not only that, but Miscanthus, it may be profitable because you can grow it on soil that's not really made for row crop corn and beans. It's more highly, more highly rollable. Um, it's not as good as soil, but Miscanthus does well on it. So um, farmers who are looking for another profit another crop, um, it's a good opportunity. Yeah, thank you, because none of the rest of us have any experience in that yet, so it's interesting to hear about. I'm, I want to come down and look at your miscanthus, so. Um, we'll touch on, I think, oh, we got 15 minutes. Hey, we got all kinds of time. Okay, um, how much do we want to leave for questions for the crowd? Okay. Okay, well then we'll go, we'll go and dig into this next question. You know, this morning we started off with uh, a discussion about digital ag um, and what, how that's changed our world and how they see, really, how they see it changing the future. And then we watch at noon, that, or we watch right after lunch there, the hackathon and see what these college kids pulled off in 24 hours. I mean, I was fascinated by the whole thing. So, you know, between digital ag, 
that, and then we just had a, a br very brief discussion about AI. How do you see, well, I guess, do you know if you're using AI now? Are you using digital ag? And how do you see, maybe from a pr producer's perspective, how do you think it could change our world? What, would it, what do we need that we can't get now that either AI changes or digital ag changes? I'll let somebody start. I, that's a hard question. Yeah. Eric, you look like you got something to oh, say. Oh boy. So if you think of AI, we are already just one of multiple scenarios going on already. Is that, is that AI already? I'm getting a lot of people looking at me strangely. Uh, no, uh, I did a Google search of AI because I knew we were going to get this. Well, not a Google search. Well, I kind of a Google search of AI. Of course, I know what it is, but I know nothing about it. So it's either two scenarios, it seems like. It's utopia. It will solve all our problems. Or in 12 years, there will be 2% of the population around, and the rest will be controlled by machines and algorithms and stuff like that. So it's hard for me to say what AI will, will look like on the farm, but maybe I'll give an example. I'll go back to this, this uh, going from a seed firmer to a smart firmer. So when it was a piece of plastic, it was collecting no information. It's now a sensor, sensors collecting all kinds of information, and I'm sure more will be available. Plus, we have all kinds of information available, like, you know, our, our weather has gotten better. You know, there's more weather stations out in the, in the countryside, so there's a piece of information. We have the characteristics of our soil and soil types. There's another piece of information. We have seed genetics. Uh, we have different fertilizers, different fertilizer rates. So basically, you know, farming is, is just like society. We are creating more information than we can uh, interpret. So why can't AI take all that information when I'm planting from my weather stations, from seed genetics, et cetera, et cetera, and let me, let me make a prediction here, not a prediction, let me, why couldn't it take control take control. Uh, God, we only got 12 years left, don't we? Uh, why, why couldn't it take control when I'm planting in the field and I see that for 10% of the time I'm not putting seed into moisture? Why couldn't it automatically start making adjustments? Because if I would have called precision planting and talked to a person, he would have probably said, are you planting deep enough? Well, they have the technology to let me know what my planting depth is. Are you getting dry soil in the, in the seed trench? You know, he would have said, put, put more down pressure on your planter. Why couldn't the machine do that for me? And then to maybe take it another step farther, uh, I do farm research. This is human beings, you know, setting up trials, uh, making sure they're statistically relevant. Why couldn't I let that machine say, hey, on 2% of your acres, we are going to basically run experiments. We are going to change plant populations. We are going to change fertilizer rates. We are going to construct it in a way that is scientifically relevant. And then we're going to pair that information when you bring a combine, a harvester over the field we will have all these little mini microplots across your acreage, and we will be able to make recommend recommendations and suggestions to you as to what to do in the future. So... What we it, need, two AIs, one to, to judge the first one, see if it was right. <laughs> <laughs> or, be, or better yet, how about this AI? How about an AI that tells me, given this set of circumstances, Here's going to be your final yield, and I know that, so I can know how to market my grain. I want to know how to market the grain. Yeah, Ask well, I, maybe I want to let it market I my grain. I want to let it market my grain, yeah. Well, <laughs> I give it a so. parameter and let it market my grain, because Lord knows I'm not very good at it. Sarah, did you have anything to touch base on that? 
Um, not really. I, I agree with that. That would be really interesting to let it. I was just thinking, who programs the AI to judge the AI? But uh, um, I, you know, being in the construction industry, I'm still pretty low tech. I need a lot of bodies on the ground. I'm hiring, by the way, if anybody wants to st has a college student or a high school student they want to stay uh, scare into staying in school, I'll make them work hard all summer, and I guarantee you their grades will go up. So. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I need bodies on the ground willing to work. I would love to have a little fleet of robots out working for me, but uh, unfortunately they're not there yet. But maybe they can tell me to follow me around and tell me a better way to build efficient, more efficiently or what I'm doing wrong. But um, it's just really fascinating, all the, all, the, all the variables that go into that. And part of me wonders if uh, you would have to tell the AI like machine, like, are you measuring the dry dirt? And without going out and digging in the dirt and seeing what's happening, you know, there's no substitution for digging in the ground and seeing what's happening with your planner. And uh, you would have to take that data and tell the AI s system, this is what I'm seeing, even though we put all the parameters for this, this is what's actually happening. And we have to adapt because every field we have is variable. There's no perfect 100% ground that's the same. So they have some catching up to do. They'll pro probably outpace me in the learning field, but um, until they can go out there and dig and see what's going on. I think it's gonna be a little slow to catch up, but I'm continually surprised at how fast I'm behind on the time, so. <laughs> Eric, did you, Eric Ron, did you want to touch anything? Well, not really, I don't understand. It's so complicated, so complex, and so involved in humanity. There's so many questions. We have to answer a society. How far are you going to let this go before you start regulating? I think we've already started regulating it, haven't we? Um, if you've got AI, is basically another mind deciding things, right? Now, why is that right? Maybe you need another AI to judge whether that one's right, and then is that one right? It, it's how many questions is it bringing? I don't think we know the answers. I don't know. I'm not. <laughs> I'm using it, and I'm sure whenever you make a phone call now to a business, your answer, whoever answers you, is, is not a human being. That's a, that's AI, for the most part. I don't know. There's just too much, too complex. You know an answer. Yeah, and I'm trying to think about the. 55 farm operations that I work with, which one of those would actually give up the opportunity to go to the field and let something else do it and tell them when. Yeah. I know we've had numerous companies here at the university that I've talked to that said, oh, well, our, our platform's gonna tell you when you can plant and you're gonna plant this field and then you're gonna drive five miles away and plant that field. And guess what, grandpa gets in the tractor, he plants this field and the one that's right beside it, he plants it too because it makes most sense to plant that one and then that one and then drive five miles. So there, there's still gonna be a human component in farming that is, and, and, and it's not a job. I mean, it's the, the passion that, that comes from these folks. That's why they're happy, because it's not a job, it's their livelihood. So we can take questions. We, got, we do have some questions. A little bit different topic. Uh, this is to anyone who wants to answer. What do you think of solar companies approaching growers to take land out of production for solar farms? I know last year we talked a little bit about agrivoltaics and how some growers and producers are utilizing solar on their property. So would love to hear your perspective on that. I've got an opinion on that. Uh, first of all, it, it does take more land, there's no doubt. We don't need to be putting it on flat, planting and drummer, number one soil where we can grow beautiful crops. We need to put it on hillsides where there's doesn't grow very good. We need to put it over parking lots, the assembly hall parking lot. What if that was all solar collectors rather than sun beating down, heating everybody's car up? We saw this in uh, Brazil when we were down there. They, shade their customers' cars under solar panels so they have a nice, cool place to park their car. Yeah, we need to think about that more. Uh, wind doesn't take up much, doesn't much uh, uh, 
farmland, uh, not nearly as much as what solar panels would. Uh, the way we the way we use them now, our solar panels are on our shop roof, and uh, it's out of the way, doesn't take up any ground. I can don't have to mow around it. So. I've certainly got an opinion, but I want to let you guys share it. Um, we have a neighbor next to us that there's a solar farm going in, and it's disheartening to me because we spent a lot of time and a lot of money to pattern tile our farm about eight, eight to nine years ago. And the solar company doesn't care because on their contract, it is written in that they need a pattern tile underneath the solar ground. So they are gonna cut through all of my tile mains that we put going from our field through their field to the drainage ditch next to it. And I probably will have uh, maybe some recourse, but it's gonna be someone who doesn't really care they don't, my concerns are not their problem. And you know, it's really frustrating that we, tile's not cheap. It's a lot of my time and money that we put into that. And we went out and we dug them in ourselves. I spent days walking in tile lines with a tile plow. And I'm gonna lose my drainage to go down to the creek. So a little bit of frustration there. And I mean, we already have, they did surveying last week, or last summer, um, just doing some early work and we were opening up our field and the combine driver called me over and said, what is this? And they had just tossed some debris garbage out in our field and he was seconds away from that going through a corn head. That would have cost me a lot of money. So I don't have a really good experience with it. I'm gonna see what happens, but unfortunately I'm gonna have a solar neighbor and I don't think it's gonna be any benefit to me and probably a detriment. Jim, go for it. You said you had an opinion. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, my opinion is I don't know why they're not going in Southern Illinois because the people down there that, that have ground that doesn't produce as much, if you offer them $2,000 an acre for solar, they jump all over it because they don't have as productive a land. They don't, I... they don't have, you know, it needs to go on the poorer soils. You know, we, we have the best farmland in the world and the last thing we should be doing is covering up food sources or something that's not very efficient. Yeah. And you know, people, people fight against each other for food and water. And if we start to mess up either one of those, we don't need to be fighting each other. It's a good thing. I mean, our, our electric bill is one-tenth of what it was before. And it's a good thing to do. We've got to use our head when we put it in my opinion. One more question. This question is from one of our hackathoners. Have any of you considered more, quote, aggressive sustainability practices such as intercropping multiple crops or crops with livestock? Uh, yeah. So we don't do livestock. Uh, part of that is just the infrastructure has disappeared in east, east central Illinois. Uh, we did add wheat to our rotation a few years back. So when you go from a corn soy rotation, you have crops growing probably four or five months out of the year in a corn soy rotation. When you go to corn soy wheat, and then we do double, uh, then we do a double crop after wheat, and we do a cover crop after our corn crop, we are generally having living roots in the soil about 30 months out of that 36 month period in that three crop rotation. So um, that is something that we have done. And I know we're kind of getting up against time, so I'll pass it off. Yeah, the, the only thing, we've got the regenerative farm north of town that we're talking about. We have to figure out how to make the equipment side work, but talking about intercropping uh, wheat and soybeans in the same crop. So we plant wheat leave a space to plant soybeans in the spring, and then we would harvest the wheat, the soybeans would be left to, to fill in that area, so we would really double crop, essentially, but the, the, the wheat should be about the same yield as it is normally on about half the population. The soybeans should be as good or better, and we believe that has an opportunity, but again, you still, it's, it's, a, it's a commitment of a different equipment. It's uh, it takes a lot of logistics, which we haven't got done yet. So, as as our climate warms up around here, 
uh, double crop uh, soybeans and, and wheat has more potential. Used to be Interstate 70 was the line. Anything um, below that, you could get pretty good double crop wheat. Anything above that, eh, two years out of three, you'd have a crop for the other year, it would freeze off. Uh, but any more guys around where I live uh, are beginning to plant double crop. Especially with the war in Ukraine, the wheat prices went up. They really got interested in that. So. Got a question over to my left. Yep. Go ahead. Eric. This is on. Yep. Yeah, so uh, my name is Eric Barnard. I'm with Harvest IQ. Your comments about uh, AI helping you with your grain marketing. Um, I, might, I might know a guy that can, that can help you there. So um, and to kind of play into that question, you know, I, I work with my dad quite a bit. We farm over in Indiana, corn and soy, and I could talk to him for hours about agronomic learnings, agronomic decision making, how we're planning for next year. But I'm sitting here looking at markets, like December corn just closed at 459 plus, you know, $2 over the last two years. At what point do you say, I'm gonna put the same kind of energy that I put into my agronomic planning and decision making and shift that focus to my, my marketing plans, trying to look across insurance and all the various new insurance products out there, hedging, my contracting strategies, got all kinds of fancy contracts now that you can do. So I just wonder, how, where do you have that internal gut shift of like, Yield is not what I'm going to try to maximize. I'm actually going to try to maximize maybe more on the price side. Uh, you're right. Yeah, that's, my, that's where you could make money for your farm is do a better job marketing. Much easier to do it that way physically. Uh, on the other hand, it's much harder to do mentally. I need to sell now when it's $7.00 and you're nine months ahead of a crop being harvested. It's not easy. I don't know if AI can do that, can they? <laughs> Maybe get a better average for you probably than I could. But, uh. So the human condition in grain marketing is fear and greed. So when the price is going up, you don't sell because, hey, the price is going up. So it was four dollars today it'll be 450 tomorrow then it gets to 450 and you say boy I, I should probably sell at 450 but you know it was just four and it went to 450 that's the that's the greed part fear is is what's happening here in the last few months corn was six dollars and then it was 550 and then it was five dollars and you don't sell because well fear has set in you are losing money and you don't say hey I've, I've made a mistake and I need to sell at a lower price you just let it go so I think AI in, in grain marketing is I hadn't really thought of that and I, and I apologize for that but yeah I think that is a big factor in spending the time and the resources to to better address grain marketing yeah is is impactful and more farmers need to do it it looks like Jack's got a question. There have been a uh, comment, Jim, that you made. I think it's kind of been a little bit of a theme with some of the panelists about how farming is a passion. Farmers have, are more satisfied with their job. And I think one of the things I would love to hear from each of you is the task that you do that would be the first thing you would want to get rid of and the task that you do that would be the last thing you would want to give up. Or if you had to give that up, you would probably just stop farming. Grain, grain marketing is gone. <laughs> okay, what's your favorite one? What's the one? Left? Favorite, well, favorite a actual operation would be harvest, of course, because then you, you, know, you get to actually see and quantify and verify uh, what, what you've done. Yeah, I agree. Harvest, you see the fruits of your labor the whole year right there, actually. It's the fun, it's the most fun for me. I'm maybe the oddball out here, but I, we store all of our grain. Um, since I'm in the grain handling industry, I feel like I have to be able to tell farmers that I do store all of my crop, which 
helps me with marketing. I have an independent marketer and I sell all my green to him. And so I have no ego in the game. And uh, I've done some preliminary tax work and he does pretty good work for me. So for very cheap pennies on the bushel. So it works great for me. Um, I love cleaning out grain bins. I love sweeping grain bins. I love scooping corn. So um, it's a great exercise and you get to, there's nothing you know, about holding something you produce. Like I love every scoop of grain that I move. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of an odd duck, but I love cleaning out grain bins. I absolutely hate greasing implements and tractors. So <laughs> reading the sticker on the side of it and you know, is that a 50 hour? Did I do that one yet? Climbing underneath, you know, a tillage gang on the ground. There's always a rock that you sit on wrong and um, and then you dig, your, you know, you slide like a snail underneath the equipment, and then of course that's when your grease gun runs out, and you gotta snake your way back out and put in a new cartridge. So that would be me. I I hate greasing equipment. I think well, if it's a quick question, Elhan. It is a quick question. So this is one of those things that I'm personally curious about, and and we can talk after the panel if you would rather. Um, Say you have a patch of land that is not that productive, where it is a pain to actually manage that piece. It floods, or it doesn't drain properly, or it is up against the cliff or something, right? What would you rather do with that land? Would you try to, you know, try to improve productivity over there with variable rate and intense management? Or would you rather, you know, plant miscanthus on it and, and put it up to ecosystem services. What well, would be more preferable from your perspective? I mean, from a farm manager's perspective, I'm going to try to maximize the return on the acre. And if that means we plant miscanthus there, that's one thing. If it's a really poor piece of land, they're probably not going to put it in, you know, if it's five or six acres, they probably wouldn't put it in solar, but that's where the solar belongs. Um, I think you have to you have to look at it and see okay what are my alternative I've got I've got acres of land that are around trees that are in a border program because the trees were taking all the water out of there we planted pollinators all the way around at 30 feet and all of a sudden that farm went from one of the five worst fields to one of the five best fields and we're, st and we're getting paid $300 an acre to, have, to, to take that land out of production. I, I love to evaluate those kinds of opportunities because just because it's, it doesn't have to be corn or soybeans. It should be evaluated ba on that basis. I was gonna say the same thing. You know, if there are, luckily we have um, programs through the FSA office, so same thing, we, if we have a spot that's not as high producing, um, we, we can put it into a uh, program where you're having pollinators, filter strip, buffer strips to control um, nutrient loss along stream banks and that kind of stuff. So you just have to make every acre work for you and you want to be a good steward of that acre, what works for that farm on that field in that situation. Driving down the road in Illinois, you think it's all the same, but it, it's not. It may be most of it is excellent farm ground, but there are spots in every farm that shouldn't be corn and beans. It should be or something else, or it could be anyway in most farms. Okay, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the panelists. They did a great job today.